Dear conference guests, the plan that we follow for most days of recollection is to have four talks, and what lends itself so well to these four talks are the four steps that St. Louis Marie de Montfort speaks of when he explains the 33-day preparation for holy slavery or total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And I urge you, if you haven't done so already, to read his book, True Devotion to Mary, in which he explains with uh, great clarity and very effective logic why it is so important to renew our baptismal vows through the hands of Mary. And it is good to know that Pope St. Pius X loved this book, True Devotion to Mary, and we are told that he even had it as his bedside reading. You know, before he fell asleep for the night, he would pick up True Devotion to Mary and uh, read it and and, and he granted, he said, whoever reads this, I grant the apostolic blessing or a special blessing. Now, it probably ceased with his death, but nevertheless, it can't come more highly recommended than that. The last canonized pope who, who loved the book True Devotion to Mary and gave this special blessing for whoever reads it as well. So you can't go wrong. But in his 33-day preparation for total consecration, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says it's important to go through four steps of spiritual preparation. And he says, devote 12 days to understanding and combating the spirit of the world. Renouncement of the world, he calls it. The second step is knowledge of self. The third step is knowledge of Mary. And the fourth step is knowledge of Jesus Christ. So those are going to be the four talks today. Those four steps. And what's interesting is that he devotes almost two weeks to combating the spirit of the world and only one week each for knowledge of self, knowledge of Mary, and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I don't know why, but apparently he felt it was important to have those 12 days for understanding how to combat the world. And If that step isn't taken, then a person can never really live the faith, never really live the vows of baptism, and and certainly never live true devotion to Mary. So my talk this morning is about renouncing the spirit of the world. And perhaps it might be good to emphasize, because we live in a world that's so... Uh, ecologically inclined, and as a matter of fact, isn't that what the modern world is all concerned about, the environment and how to be ecological? And then, of course, even the Vatican II Church has picked up this banner. The environment, the environment. Well, what about the salvation of souls? They've lost sight of that and are focused more on the things of earth. But when we say hatred of the world, we don't mean to hate God's creation. We don't hate the earth. We shouldn't abuse the earth. That's a misuse of God's creation to wait to be wasteful or needlessly destructive of this world in which God placed us. We see, of course, St. Francis of Assisi in such harmony with nature that the animals came up to him. They, they sensed his love of God. His, he was so in tune with God that he loved nature in the right way. But St. Francis is not the patron saint of environmentalism. He is first and foremost 
the saint of how to love God and die to self and renounce the world. The spirit of the world is what we're talking about here. We have to renounce the spirit of the world, not hate the earth in which we live. As scripture tells us, God made it all. It's all good. The saints used the world in the right way. And they were most certainly not of the spirit of the world. So perhaps it was unnecessary, but I made that distinction. We don't hate the earth. We only hate the spirit of worldliness or should hate the spirit of worldliness, which will keep a person away from God. Let's listen to these words of Uh, from the imitation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus as written by a Jesuit, Father Peter Arnout. I think that's the way to pronounce his name. And he wrote this, I believe, over a hundred years ago. It's been reprinted. But several chapters of of his book, Imitation of the Sacred Heart, are devoted to helping us understand the evil of the spirit of the world. And what he teaches us is that we have to live in the world. You as laity especially have to live in the world, but it's the all-important challenge of not being of the world. You know, I think that simple, simplistic explanation is very effective, to live in the world, but not to be of the world. So let's listen to his words. And he's, he uses this as the voice of Jesus speaking to us. Woe to the world, my child. Woe to the heart that clings to its allurements and its vanities. It is not enough to cast Satan out of your heart. You must also expel the world. If you inwardly cherish the world... and. <clears throat> And perhaps we should think worldliness. If we cherish worldliness, whatever else you may do to amend yourself shall avail you little. The world will continue to infect your heart, will doubtless pervert and finally betray you into the power of the demons. And now he defines what this world is or worldliness What is the world except an inordinate or perverse love of pleasure, riches, and honors? So there's the definition. Loving those things more than eternal treasures, the things that will last eternally. Seeking after the corrupt or the things that will corrupt and lead one away instead of the treasures in heaven that cannot perish. If you desire to know what you ought to think of the world, consider what I myself have judged of it. Behold, I pass through life doing good to all. I loved the enemies that persecuted me. When fastened to the cross, I prayed for those that crucified me. But for the world, I prayed not. I've always found that to be such a powerful statement right there. Our Lord's praying for the evildoers, but he's not praying for the salvation of worldliness because it won't, it can't be saved. It's by definition turned away from God, turned away from eternal realities. So it shows us what our attitude should be, and I think St. Augustine put it perfectly when he said we hate the sin but not the sinner. Woe will befall us. Woe to us if we love the sin. But that's what the world wants us to do, to love the sin. We can never, ever do that. We must hate the sin. 
If I see somebody about to take poison, I hate what's happening there. And if I love that person, I will do everything I can to keep that person from ingesting the poison. I have to hate what he or she is about to do, but because I love him or her. So remember that. Hate the sin. And what and what's interesting to see is that as we see the world descend into more and more depravity, we see the expectation, you must accept the sin. You must love the sin. And if we are to be followers of Christ, we can never, ever do that. Back to the imitation of the sacred heart. The world is of the devil, is wholly placed in wickedness, and cannot possess my spirit. Even as falsehood cannot be truth, as corruption cannot be purity, the world is itself a proof not only of the undeniable existence, but even of the necessity of a hell. What can there be in common between the world and my heart since the world either openly or secretly favors every vice while my heart breathes nothing except what is holy? The world, in league with Satan, its prince, seeks for souls to destroy them forever. My heart longs to save them all. You cannot therefore serve the world and me, for if thou art the friend of the world, thou becomest the enemy of my heart. When we look at the time of our Lord, we see that the leading people of the time had fallen into indeed a worldliness. And they had achieved something that should never be achieved, which was the mixing of religion with the world. It's interesting to note that the high priests at our Lord's time were not even descendants of Aaron, like this law strictly enjoined. You have to be of the Aaronic descent. And the high priests, Annas and Cephas, for example, they were Roman government appointees. The government was controlling the church in that way. And it should never be that way. So that's happening now. We see the blend, the amalgam between religion and the world. And we know that that can never be of God. There will, also, there will always have to be a healthy sense of separation from the world. To not have the spirit of the world even though we must live in the world. I was thinking also of the temptations of our Lord the three temptations, which exhibit, I think, the three enemies that we all have to fight. Catholic spiritual, theolo- uh, spirit- the spiritual life and the- uh, theology teach us our three enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And every day of our lives, we're going to have to fight these three enemies. Believe it or not, when we get out of bed in the morning, you know what's happening? We're stepping on a battlefield. Actually, as soon as we're awake, we're still in bed, we're on the battlefield. Why? Because we have a fallen nature. That's our biggest enemy, of course. And the devil never sleeps. He's watching us 24-7. So we have to beware of his snares and his attacks really all the time. Just like when a soldier is going out in the battlefield, he just doesn't stroll out there. He's looking everywhere, wherever there may be an attack coming at him, whatever direction. It's the same way we have to be spiritually because we carry our fallen nature with us throughout our lives. The devil never sleeps. And then the world is there, more or less. And when you go out to the world to do the necessary work you have to do, the shopping, things of this nature, we have to realize that the world is trying to insinuate itself 
into our lives with its false philosophies and false thinkings. And what's the world telling us through so many advertisements and and promotions? Live for this life. Have a good time. Make a kingdom for yourself here on earth. I mean, will you find, for example, in any store except a religious store, a true, a true Catholic bookstore, will you find anything in there about making your soul better? About sanctifying yourself? No, it's all about this life. It's all about the body. It's all about the things that perish and go away. And we can't take it with us to the next life. So we have to be aware of that. The world is insidious that way. But going back to the three temptations that our Lord experienced, and actually he didn't experience temptation. He's perfect, infinitely perfect. But the devil thought he was tempting our Lord. And our Lord teaches us how to combat those temptations. The first temptation, it, it was especially directed to what we would what would be fallen nature. Well, of course, our Lord didn't have fallen nature. But what was he tempting our Lord, or thought he was tempting him to do? Gorge yourself on this bread. Sensuality. Give in to your fallen nature, which he thought our Lord had, but he didn't. And then the second temptation, a temptation to pride, which is a, maybe a combination of all three enemies of the soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Throw yourself off the cliff and then ask God's angels to come and, and uh, you know, catch you just before you hit the ground. And then the third temptation, which is definitely a combination of both an appeal to the world and an appeal to himself, the the evil prince himself. He took him up to the, you know, to a high place and showed him all of the glory of the world. And he says, I'll give it all to you. You'll have all of this, the power, the fame, the glory, the riches. Just bow down and worship me. So you see, those three enemies are exhibited in the three temptations that our Lord went through and showed us how to deal with it. He gave us words of scripture, and he, of course, was teaching us to pray and to not fall into these allurements. A few more thoughts here from Father Arnut about the world If you are a votary of the world, you will perish with the world. But if you follow my heart, you will go into life everlasting. What good has the world done for you that you would devote your affections to it? It has done and never will do thee anything but evil. Trust not, my child, to the smiles and blandishments of the world. They show only a covert desire to deceive and destroy thee. But hearken to the invitings of my heart that longs to save thee from the everlasting misfortunes which the world is preparing for thee. If you do not forsake the world, the world will forsake you when you are spent and worn out in its service. Yes, it will laugh and mock at your destruction. And when you stand most in need of help, you will be alone and powerless. Haven't we seen this so many times in history? Somebody giving himself to these worldly pursuits. And then when the world doesn't perceive anything of service from this person, it drops this person and laughs at that person's destruction. Of course, there may be a final grace in that when a person has been dropped, you know, at that, at that point in his or her life, it, there may be a chance there to finally turn to God. But they have to, they're learning it in the most bitter way. They're learning it the hard way, that the world is a hard taskmaster. Oh, yes, if, if everything's succeeding, you're up on the pedestal, but fail and the world will laugh at you. 
and mock you because it really doesn't have your interests at heart. Father Arnut, how deceitful the world is. My child, the whole world is made up of deceits. And by its arts and wiles, it allures to itself the unwary. It holds out to man pleasures, honors, and riches, and says, All these things will I give thee if thou serve me. But attend thou not to what it promises, but what it gives. And we see over and over again how the world fails to deliver on its promises. And you know, one thing the world cannot do is to make us truly happy. Again, St. Augustine, Thou has made our hearts for Thee, O God, and they are restless until they rest in Thee. St. Augustine, well, this is when he was not saint, when he was Augustine, he drank from the chalice that the world offered him. He sinned greatly. He wore out his mother for 30 years who kept persevering and suffering and weeping for him. And he finally got the message, the world can't make me happy. Worldlings, by definition, chase illusions. Life is frustrating. So many things that you want won't turn out. Whereas if you serve God, everything you do for for him, for the love of him, you will have an eternal reward for it. There's no frustration in the service of God, but there is truly frustration in the service of the world. Again, Father Arnut, didst thou ever find a worldling, even the most fortunate, whose heart was every way satisfied? Neither shalt thou find such a one even if you search the whole earth. The world indeed promises good things, but in reality it bestows true evils only. Because what it gives makes man wicked and hinders him by no means from being truly unhappy. The disciple says, Yet, Lord... Worldlings frequently obtain possession of those things which they covet, and therefore they care little for the spiritual distresses of the heart. Answer from our Lord. Even so, my child, grant that they abound in whatever things they may lust after in this world, as they possess them with an inordinate affection they, and misuse them, they enjoy them not, except for their present and future unhappiness. Besides, they appear indeed not to care for the interior tortures of the soul. But my child, if thou couldst look as I do into their hearts, thou should see how many things they suffer within, which they endeavor to hide outwardly, and thou wouldst conclude that the happiness of man consists not in having an abundance of the things of this world, but rather herein that he keeps his heart free from every worldly object and calmly and permanently satisfied in me. Moreover, how long shall these things of worldlings last? Behold, yet a little while, and eternity shall summon them to appear. What then shall the plentifulness of delights and other things avail them? They shall leave the world, taking with them nothing except the load of their sins. When you look at the longest life on earth, my dear brethren, it's a puff of smoke compared to eternity. It's over in a flash. I know it doesn't seem that way as we go through life. You know, it seems to stretch interminably, and then one day, it's all going to be over. Be grateful for any grace that you receive that helps you to see how ephemeral and passing the things of the world are. This happened in the life of St. Francis Borgia, whose feast we celebrate today. He was a duke. And he actually was living in the married state. He had married and 
was, had eight children. His wife died, he, and, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. One day he was asked to accompany the body of Queen Isabella, and she was the mother of the mighty King Philip II of Spain, if I remember my history correctly. And we know that under Philip II, Spain especially uh, spread its power and influence throughout the world. And uh, the Philippines are named after Philip II of Spain because that was one of the territories that the, that the Spaniards claimed and colonized. But anyway... His mother died. She was uh, likely, uh, well, not only wealthy, but beautiful in appearance, perhaps likely caught up with the things of the world. And she received the last rites, I'm sure, before she died. And so the Duke of Gandia, he was the fourth Duke of Gandia, he was sent to accompany her to her funeral to where her body was actually going to be laid to rest. And then somehow by accident, this was days after she died, her casket accidentally opened up. I don't know the details, whether it was partially dropped or something happened, but it opened up. And a most sickening sight presented itself to everybody there. As happens with the human body, as it's decaying, rotting away. And as I remember reading the story, people ran away in horror. But Francis, who himself was uh, noble and wealthy, he, he made himself stay and he he made a meditation about this. It was the great turning point of his life. And he said, Oh, my mighty sovereign, yesterday you were in such glory and power and you know, attractive appearance, and today you are the food of worms. And I believe it was about this time that his wife passed away and he made provisions for all of his children and he entered the Jesuit order because he saw in a very powerful way the fleetingness of life, what it all really is. Some paintings of St. Francis Borgia show him holding a skull with a crown on top. And it's, it's symbolic. It's not meant to represent Isabella. She wasn't a bad queen. But it's the, the crown of an emperor. And it's in that painting because that was the turning point. So he was Catholic before, but he was probably a worldly Catholic. Taken up too much with the things of this life, of this, the things of this world. And... He became actually one of the superior generals, superiors general of the Jesuit order. And we honor him today. He, he was called to that second vocation. So very likely we've had a moment, perhaps not as dramatic as that in our lives, where we realized life is fragile. And what really matters is not what I do in terms of temporal pursuits and gains. Yes, I have to have goals to support myself, to achieve this and my business life, etc. Those are fine and good, but they are subordinated to my overall goal, which is to become the saint that God wants me to become. Let us thank God for those moments in our lives where we've seen what life is really all about. It could have been the, <clears throat> the death of a loved one or, or some other tra- tragedy that happened in our lives or something that where we woke up one day and just realized, you know, it 
could all be gone in a flash. It will be gone for many people today. You see, that thought of death is anathema to a world thing. Because that's the end of everything he or she is living for. So death is something to get rid of. Just don't think about it. Put it off. You know, just assume I'm going to have a very long life. But scripture has some pretty dramatic and unkind words. So thou fool. If we want to put away that thought, it's reality. It's what life is all about. And you know, if we've lived our life as we should, striving for holiness, living our vocation to the best of our ability, you know what the day of our death will be? It will be the most beautiful day of our life because our life was in focus. We knew what life was all about and it will be the beautiful ending for a beautiful for a series of chapters which our life is made up of. It will be the transition to eternity. And we, will, we hope to stand before God with the scales of justice which we see in the stained glass window of St. Michael's stained glass a window. We hope that our good deeds will outweigh any bad that happened. So I think we've demonstrated how passing the world is. You know, actually, let me just read a little bit more from the Imitation of the Sacred Heart. Here's, this is chapter 18. To serve the world is a cruel slavery. The voice of Jesus, my child, he that loves to serve the world knows not the world. The world is a true tyrant. How many things, what sacrifices does it not exact from its votaries, whom for all their services it repays with unceasing evils? It demands that its slaves become the base tools of their passions, that they sacrifice body and soul, that they damn themselves without complaint. And when it has completed their destruction, it forsakes them as useless wretches. Ah, at how great a cost do worldlings purchase their own ruin. If they did for me the half of what they do for the world, how happy they should be and what saints. How cruel is the world's slavery? Under it, how many interior sufferings must be undergone? What hardships endured? And all this for the hope of obtaining such things as when once tasted cause death or such as will produce tortures either at present by the irksome possession of them or after a while by a bitter separation. I remember something that St. Alphonsus Liguori mentions in, I think, his book, Preparation for Death. By the way, fantastic book to overcome the spirit of the world because it's all about be ready for your last end. Live your life as you should. And, of course, the thought of death helps us to focus like nothing else. But St. Alphonsus Liguori mentions that one day the mighty Alexander the Great, who was conquering entire civilizations and cities. Anywhere he went, he conquered. He was amazingly successful as a general. And he had the Macedonian Grecian army that was just following him everywhere. To, or he was leading them to all these conquests. And one day he was found sitting at night, looking up at the moon, and there were tears in his eyes. And his courtiers asked him, what's wrong, your, your majesty? He says, I can't go up there and conquer it. You see, our hearts were made for infinite good. That's the way God made us. He made us for himself. And therefore, nothing below God 
can make us completely happy. We will always want more. Alexander, as he's conquering basically the whole known world at the time, wants to do more. He can't, he's not satisfied. You read about all these millionaires and billionaires that are just so unhappy if they don't make the next million dollar acquisition. What are they trying to do? They're trying to fill a heart that has a capacity for the infinite God, so to speak. They're trying to fill it with finite things. And of course, they will never get to the point and say, I'm completely satisfied. Because all of these things are actually not even, they're not only below God, they're even below us. How can inanimate things make us truly and completely happy? They can't. It's an illusion and it's a lie to say that those things will. But unfortunately, how many people live for those things? So you see, we have to dust the world off of ourselves. Even as traditional Catholics, we have to realize again, we're not living up on a mountain away from society. We're not called to do that. We are called, as our Lord said, to be the light to the world to be the city on the mountaintop, to be the candle on the candlestick shining to all in the house. So our Lord isn't saying, Every, you know, all my followers get up and let's flee to the wilderness. He said, stay there, but don't let the world lead you astray. You lead the world. You show the world where it needs to go. But our Lord was time and again, preaching a healthy kind of separation so that we don't imbibe the spirit of the world. And that can happen. It can happen, I would say, even easily. We have to be careful not to let the world come at us and subconsciously be influencing the decisions that we make. This is why prayer is so important. We get to brush off the world, the dust of the world that we may have accumulated by being in the world. If we don't brush it off, we accumulate more and more of the world's dust. So meditation, prayer, examination of conscience, it helps us to refocus. What is it all about? It's not about this life as our ultimate goal. It's all about eternity and getting to where we need to be and to live in the world but not be of the world. One of the great indictments that I see of Vatican II is that it it erased the line between the church and the world and made no bones about it. You know, the pre-Vatican II talks by John the Twenty-Third and other modernist hierarchy were about, you know, let's go out and dialogue with the world. Let's, they, may, they may not have said embrace the world, but they almost may have said that. And in doing so, we see the sad results of the utter loss of faith and morals amongst Vatican II Catholics. The statistics are shocking. How many Vatican II Catholics are, the majority are in fa- some degree, are in, are in favor of some degree of abortion. 60% are in favor of homosexual marriage. This, the, these came out from the Quinnipiac University statistics two years ago. The majority of them, almost two to one, want women priests. Seventy percent of them reject the church's teaching on artificial birth control, and 90 percent of them or more practice it. How did this happen? It wasn't just because of watering down doctrine, but it was because they said, you know, the world is no longer our enemy. Let's, let's, let's open up to the world. Instead of leading the world where it needed to go, it began to say, let's dialogue with them. Well, what does the world have to offer to the church? Nothing. 
except destruction. We know what the faith is. We know what God's teaching is. We know what's right and wrong. And we have to lead the world. That's what the early Christians did. That's what true Catholics have done throughout the centuries. And when it came time to die for those faith and morals, Catholics did it as martyrs. We reject the sins against God's Ten Commandments. We will always reject them. But you see, by embracing the world, you lose your faith and your morals. You know, John the 23rd talked about letting fresh air into the church. What was he doing? He was opening up by his Vatican Council too to the poisonous smog of the world. He says, let's let it in. And we see, when, we, when you see the way so many people live, people that call themselves Catholics even, they live very worldly lives. The world is no longer an enemy, and it got them. They don't realize how much the world is influencing them. You know, I was reading something from Yota Unum by Professor Romano Amerio. Unfortunately, he's just a conservative Vatican II Catholic. I don't know if he's living now, but he didn't, he failed to see the ultimate problem. But he does point out various problems. And just something I read this morning, uh, this was after Vatican Council II. This is December 24th of 1965. And, and it's really shock. I, I shouldn't be shocked at anything Paul VI did. I'm convinced he was Freemasonic to the core. He knew what he was doing. He authorized the destruction of the Mass, the sacraments, and promulgated everything of Vatican II. I shouldn't be shocked, but I am. And I'm going to read to you something uh, that he said in one of his many heretical statements. This was, again, December 24th, 1965. The church, with its demanding and precise attitude to dogma, impedes free conversation and harmony among men. Let me, let me repeat that. That is such bold audacity saying the doc, when we preach the doctrines of the church, we are a problem. Again, the church with its demanding and precise attitude to dogma, impedes free conversation and harmony among men. Again, calling the church the problem. Continue. It is a principle of division in the world rather than of union. How are division, disagreement, and dispute compatible with its Catholicity and its sanctity? He's setting up all kinds of false comparisons here. What did our Lord say? You are either with me or you are against me. And Paul VI dared to say, that's a problem now. We're not really the way we're supposed to be if we're going to be so dogmatic. Didn't our Lord say the truth will set you free? Yes, we preach it with love, but we don't water down the truth. And then he says, we should not be a division, but he says we should be something else. Again, a shocking statement that he made. The Pope replies to this difficulty by saying that Catholicism is a principle of distinction, but not of division. And the distinction is, he says, of the same sort as that involved in the case of language, culture, art, or profession. Now, he tries to make up for it later on by what he says, but I, to me, it doesn't matter what he says later. You can't save this. this you can't save this. It's a problem. When he says, it's, the church is not about division, it's about distinction. In other words, it's the flavor of the month. In effect, is what he said. And then he tried to save it. 
sorry. Your denial of the faith shows way too much there. What did Simeon say to Our Lady when she presented him in the temple with St. Joseph? Yes, he rejoiced to see, thou, now thou dost dismiss thy servant, O Lord, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. But he says, then, thy soul, thy own soul, a sword shall pierce. Your child will be set up as a sign of contradiction. You see, the marriage that was being preached between the church and the world, it was, very, it was subtle. But when you really analyze it, you see how bold it was. Again, this does, being a follower of Christ doesn't mean we hate anyone. But we should hate sin and we should hate heresy. Remember that statement from Father Faber from his book, The Precious Blood. He says, there can be no holiness without hatred of heresy. Why? Because heresy is one of the greatest sins imaginable. If we don't hate it, how can we truly say we love God? So I wanted to just share this with you in this morning's reflection. Yes, we do have to renounce the spirit of the world. As laity, you live in the world, but it will be an effort, a real spiritual effort to be not of the world. And instead of letting the world, worldly people drag us down, we have to lift them up. Oh, it's not going to be easy. We may be mocked. We may be persecuted. We shouldn't be surprised. The servant is not above the master, our Lord said. But what always happens, that if anybody of goodwill, even though the mocking or persecuting words or behavior may happen, you know what they're thinking inside? If, and if they would admit it, they would say, that person really stands up for what he or she believes in. That person's not the wavering reed that's just going along with the flow. This person is willing to swim against the current. That's the hallmark of a true follower of Christ. I remember the saying, if you were put on trial for being a follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Let's hope there's plenty of evidence to convict us of being a follower of Jesus Christ and of one who recognizes that the spirit of the world is the enemy. And we must not let that infect us, but rather brush it off and keep following, carrying our cross on the way to Calvary to our eternal reward. If we have suffered with Christ, we will most certainly reign gloriously and be rewarded with him and by him.